I've just spent a lot of time talking about the wealthy and what they do to uh, expand their hold on power and hold on tighter to that power and make themselves feel better about doing that. But there are millions of other Americans whose lives are changing in this period, some for the better, some for the worse. But they feel increasingly pushed out of decision making in American society. 25 million immigrants, millions of farm to city migrants, millions of ex-slaves, millions of whites in the South who have been pushed to the side by economic transformation, in many cases have lost their land and become sharecroppers too. All of these people are also doing things. They're also acting and trying to better their circumstances, trying to change the history they're living in. They don't necessarily succeed, and they certainly don't always form alliances with each other. But they too are creating their own cultures, their own society that responds to these dramatic economic changes. And we can see this, first of all, in the new industrial towns and cities. What we see is that even as the spatial changes in those cities create new wealthy enclaves, working class enclaves, many of them focused around factories or around churches that cater particul to particular ethnic groups of uh, the new immigrants, these form a coherence of their own. And they develop their own institutions. Uh, there are bars that open up when the factories close and where men spend much of their time and build associations, including, to a large extent, the movement for an eight-hour day that is the major labor movement of the 1880s. There are social halls uh, where the weddings of Polish immigrants and the celebrations of Greek immigrants and so on and so forth are played out. There are churches that become the focus of particular festivals that are imported from the old country. All of these things create identity, they create coherence, and they create a sense of belonging in the new, uh, the new communities that form in the new uh, U.S. of the Second Industrial Revolution. In the 1880s, a young woman named Jane Addams, a graduate from Smith College, one of the new women's educational institutions that spring up in the wake of the Civil War, comes to Chicago and ultimately becomes one of the most famous social activists uh, in the history of the United States. But part of what motivates Jane Addams is the sense that the social activism that, for instance, she saw in her father, uh, who had been uh, a major reformer and opponent of slavery in the 1850s, the sense that that kind of social activism had disappeared in the United States and that something had been lost not just in the loss of social activism and the end of the abolitionist movement, but in the change in the United States away from a society motivated by an ideal, uh, ideals of equality and republicanism, to a society that was driven prim primarily by the pursuit of economic growth. Now these were her ideas. I'm not saying that Everybody in the United States before 1860 was driven by the pursuit of equality. That's certainly not true. And clearly, she herself and her life demonstrated that the idea of justice and the idea of a broader democratization of political sovereignty and economic opportunity, that these things were still possible in the United States. But what her example really demonstrates, because she went on to, to found something called Hull House, a settlement house that was an institution for social reform in the middle of one of these uh, immigrant heavy neighborhoods uh, in industrializing Chicago. What her example demonstrates is that increasingly in the late 19th century, large numbers of Americans felt that the society was moving in the wrong direction and that some of the initial ideals of the United States had been abandoned abandoned in the pursuit of greater economic integration, greater economic wealth, that left many Americans pushed to the side, unable to achieve any kind of uh, growth, any kind of significant transformation in their own destinies, unable to have an equal voice in the politics of their society simply because they did not have equal wealth. What we'll see over the next few sections is that that growing sense that another push for reform, another 
sort of broader critique of unequal institutions in U.S. society, just like the push against slavery, was going to create a crisis in capitalism. Not just a systematic critique, but an attempt to institute new kinds of regulations, new kinds of controls, and new kinds of politics within this growing phenomenon of U.S. capitalism.